popular culture. Um, a guy who came from San Francisco, Petrero Hill, uh, the hard knocks, a gang member, made his way to USC, arguably one of the greatest running backs in the history of college football uh, in L.A., which is a, the media capital. Uh, so he got the attention of certainly of Hollywood. And then he makes his way to the NFL, although he plays in Buffalo. The fact is he's um, th th this is somebody who uh, it, who. America let into their living room every Sunday. He became a pitchman for products, Hertz rental car. Then he went into the movies. Mm -hmm. uh, he was somebody who was remarkable in terms of uh, the impact that he had. And I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of people in America, I'm, I'm convinced of this, who were bigoted in their hearts. Mm -hmm. But they felt better about themselves because they loved him. Uh, there's research to show that O.J. Simpson tested colorless that people did not see him. White people did not see him as a black man. Uh, and, you know, one of the odd, odd things about this trial, when he was accused of murder, a uh, double murder, was that uh, the jury essentially uh, uh, came in a, with a not, verdict, guilt, uh, not guilty verdict, in large measure because they thought the LAPD had framed him. Uh, oddly enough, if you go into the department, if you understand how the LAPD operates, the rank and file officers loved the guy. He did. He did. Um, he did fundraisers for the LAPD. They let him off the hook on multiple yeah. occasions when he, he was called to their. They were called to his home after beating uh, Nicole Simpson. So uh, he was a complex figure, uh, very very polarizing in so many mm -hmm. respects. That's what I was going to say. So I wasn't living here yet. I was still in Denver covering this story um, at the NBC affiliate there in Denver at KUSA. But I remember the newsroom being on opposite sides. Family members being on opposite sides. Opposite sides. Everybody took a side, and uh, it was just very emotional from the beginning, from the accusations through the trial. Uh, it was so emotional for people. Uh, right. There was no better example of that than when the verdict was read. Because when the verdict was read, if you were uh, with in in one neighborhood of Los Angeles or in the country, mm. uh, and it was not guilty, they cheered. I remember being right outside uh, the uh, the courthouse or the uh, at the time, uh, the criminal courts building, the street was blocked off, thousands of people on the street. When they read not guilty, an entire cheer went up. It was like a football stadium going up. If you were with uh, a, a group of white people, yeah. they had the complete opposite reaction. Show it, it showed the disparity in justice in America between whites and blacks, and that was fundamental to this entire case. What was it about O.J. Simpson? Because you talked about his uh, ability to penetrate different facets of society, especially white culture. What was it about him as a person that's allowed him to get in, if you will? Well, it's interesting. Good point. Uh, he was a charismatic guy. Uh, he, he was somebody who, um, when he was at SC, he started making friends not just on campus but off campus. And, uh, it, it, you know, frankly, a lot of his friends, his closest friends, were white. Um, and and he, he was the kind of person who had a personality that I think uh, made people feel very comfortable around him. I mean, he had some very strong, very loyal uh, friends, uh, you know, Robert Kardashian, uh, you know, one of them, for example, a lot of his friends in Hollywood were, uh, were, were you know, high-ranking members of the media community. And I think in part because he, you know, I talked with them on several occasions. I talked with them during the civil trial. And, uh, and it was, it's, you know, it, he would, he, during the civil trial, he'd come out because you're not in custody. Uh, and he talked to reporters and, he, you know, and you realized very quickly, okay, I, this guy, I can see why people like him. Really quickly, because Con, I want to I want to hit on this because I'm so fascinated by it. Being a, being a black man and, and watching this trial and the support of the black community, did he not get that backlash from the black community because he was so in with white society? Well, it's interesting. Um, remember where L.A. was at the time. We had just come out of Rodney King. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a tremendous amount of uh, distrust with the LAPD. There was distrust with the system. A lot of people don't point out to the fact that prior to Rodney King, there was a case of a, a Latasha Harlins. This is a black girl who went into a Korean store yes. uh, and was shot in the head because the Korean uh, store owner thought she was shoplifting. And the store owner got essentially probation. So there had been ticking up to this, and you know don't, you don't have to go as far back as '65 and the riots there, but there is a long history of disconnect between the LAPD and uh, and and the black community, and that was part of it. That was uh, yeah, I mean there essentially was jury nullification because at that point they said, you know what, we've gone through enough. This guy gets a pass. 
It's interesting you say he was never afraid to talk publicly. He'd walk out of the courthouse and talk with you. We also were, we found out about this uh, on social media. It was through his X page on social media. His family came to that. Uh, let me show you this on the, on the iPad. It says, on April 10th, our father, Orenthal James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer. Uh, he was surrounded. You guys have that? It should be connected. Um, he was, he was surrounded by his children and grandchildren during this tri time of transition. His family asked that you please respect wishes, um, their, their privacy and, and grace. And I want to show you this, Conan and, and, and Michael. I want to show you what he posted. This is his last post on his ex page. And he talks, this is, this is after he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. That was in early February. This is February 24th before the Super Bowl. Take a listen. Beautiful day it is here in Las Vegas. Even though the game is indoors, it wouldn't have mattered, but still, it's nice to have a beautiful day like this. Hey, let me take a moment to say thank you to all the people who've reached out to me. Uh, uh, my health is good. I mean, obviously, I'm dealing with some issues, uh, but hey, I think I'm just about over it, and I'll be uh, back on that golf course, hopefully, in a couple of weeks. But it was very nice hearing from you and hearing those good, positive words. Thank you. Now, as far as the game goes, uh, obviously, my And then he goes on to talk about the Super Bowl. But again, this is shortly after his, his diagnosis went public. Um, and that was his very last post on his page, which he posted a lot, a lot of videos. Right. He was a very social guy. I mean, there were occasions where uh, after the trial and after the civil trial, um, I remember there being a, a news story somewhere in his neighborhood, and he got in a golf cart and came by to see the reporters because he just just wanted a jawbone with them and kind of and, and th that that OJ was very social guy, and um, and so I, I'm, I'm actually surprised he didn't do that more often right. uh, with those videos, um, and I, I think one of the things that he um, uh, was. We, he hated was the fact that after the trial, uh, he was to a certain degree, uh, you know, th th there were so many people just didn't want to have anything to do with him. Mm -hmm. uh, he had lost his social, uh, you know, cachet uh, in society. Uh, but yeah, he was an out uh, outgoing fellow. Um, the, the prosecution says that's, you know, part of the definition of a sociopath was that he is extremely outgoing and that uh, and that when he would cry at the uh, at testimony as to how Nicole Brown died, he wasn't crying because of the pain she went through. He was crying because uh, he had lost his wife. Uh, and so, so yeah, it, it, it doesn't surprise me. Complicated figure, yeah. but I can't, I, can't, I can't underscore this enough. He was a unique, dramatic figure in American uh, society at that time. There was no one like him. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was in America's living room almost every day for years, and they loved him. All right, Conan, can you stay with us for sure. a couple of minutes? We want to toss now to NBC's Jay Gray. He has more at Simpson's life and career. A Heisman Trophy winner and NFL Hall of Fame running back, O.J. Simpson, will be remembered most for something he could never run from. Born Orenthal James Simpson in 1947, he was raised by a single mom on the rough side of San Francisco. His way out, football. A college star at USC, he was drafted by the Buffalo Bills, where he had a record-setting NFL career, including a league MVP. He retired as one of the best to ever play the game. And for OJ, the spotlight never dimmed. Nobody does it better than... Transitioning into a successful career in TV and movies. That's great. He was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1985, the same year he married his second wife, Nicole Brown. The couple had two children, but apparently a rocky marriage that included allegations of domestic abuse. Nicole Brown Simpson filed for divorce in February of 1992, and just over two years later, she and a friend, Ron Goldman, were found murdered in her Brentwood home. Simpson may be driving a white or light colored Ford Bronco. Five days after the deadly attack, driven by a former teammate, Simpson led officers on a low-speed chase across Los Angeles, threatening to take his own life before eventually surrendering to police. He was charged with murder. The court proceedings dubbed the trial of the century. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit lasted nine months every minute. We, the jury in the involved in title action, find the defendant or Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the... On live TV. Justice was not served. Searching for that justice, the Goldman family won a civil suit. Simpson ordered to pay more than $33 million. 
He returned to court multiple times over the next several years for traffic violations, even pirating cable TV. But it was a Las Vegas robbery in 2008, Simpson saying he was taking back stolen personal property that ultimately sent him to prison. Count one, conspiracy to commit a crime. Guilty. Count Sentenced two. to 33 years, he served just over nine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before being paroled in 2017. Jay Gray, NBC News. And this was just handed to us. This is the headline here in the uh, Daily News, not guilty. And it says, uh, relieve Simpson hugs attorney. Goldman's sister breaks down and sobs. And Conan, two different sides of this, obviously, it, the, the verdict and the trial. And if you ask anybody uh, their feelings about the news here today with his passing at 76 years old, you're going to get different reactions mm -hmm. from folks. You certainly Depending are. Depending on what side of the trial you sit on. You know, I've already heard them. You yeah. know, I've already heard them. Uh, some very sympathetic. Uh, you know, this is a guy who um, came from a, a very difficult upbringing uh, and made his way in life and was um, and was it was framed by a uh, racist police department to those who say, listen, um, it, it's about time. And that uh, what is lost here is the death of Bron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson and the and the and the horror that the Goldman family have had to live through for decades. Mm -hmm. now. Right. And feeling like they've never gotten justice for what happened here. We did right. reach out to Fred Goldman and he did give us a comment this morning. Uh, here's what he says to us. He says, the only thing I have to say is it's just further reminder of Ron being gone. We have this on the iPad of Ron being gone all of these years. It's no great loss to the world. It's a further reminder of Ron's being gone. Uh, so you know that this family uh, knew this would come at some point, but they've gone through so much so publicly, uh, their lives are never the same. And, they're, and, and you can only imagine what they're thinking today. You're right. And Kim Goldman, the, uh, the little sister who I got to know a little bit uh, during the trial, um, your heart goes out for them. And, and yeah, you know, there, there was, uh, we were wall to wall coverage on this right. for, for weeks and weeks. We, uh, at KNBC, I did a special show for CNBC and the network every half hour, every day for a half hour. And although there was a tremendous amount of attention, you could not lose sight of the fact it was a depressing story on every level. Not only were there people who had died uh, a horrible death, but it also showed you how disconnected uh, society was when it came to justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and again, this cross-pollination of media and race and justice and celebrity, uh, we really, you know, they... they yeah, there are several other cases that have been called the trial of the century. This one really right. was because there had never been this confluence of these elements all at once, and he was at the center of it. So many layers to this. A I lot. Mean, you just laid them all out there right. for us. Wow. A lot. You know, retired NBC4 News reporter Patrick Healy uh, covered O.J. Simpson for decades. Uh, he joins us now live. Talk us through your coverage of the murders, the trial. You covered it every single day for weeks. Uh, what were some of the most shocking moments, and, and what is your feeling today? Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Lynette and Michael, for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, it, it's difficult to process everything that has happened. It is difficult to process O.J. Simpson's life. As Conan touched on, there were so many extremes, from extreme highs to extreme horror. And this all happened during the course of one lifetime that, again, as Conan observed, we in America watched on almost a daily basis. The trial was akin to that. It lasted nine months. And talk about living a trial the jurors were sequestered, meaning they went to a hotel room every night after they heard the, heard the testimony. And of course, they were not allowed to discuss the case with each other. Jurors are not allowed to do that until after the case goes to the jury and they can begin deliberations. So this case totally took over the jurors' lives. It took over America's life. And we would hear this broad range of testimony, uh, damning DNA evidence, that tied O.J. Simpson to the murder scene, uh, that tied one of the victims, his wife Nicole, to blood found inside Simpson's house, to blood that was found on Simpson's car. Uh, and on the other side of the case, there was this exculpatory evidence about O.J. Simpson that was mainly in the form of attacking the credibility of law enforcement. And again, uh, LAPD was going through rocky times during the 1990s, and uh, there were a lot of people in our community who were willing to doubt LAPD, 
who were willing to think that this was motivated uh, by some kind of uh, racial agenda rather than a dispassionate rule of the facts, uh, review of the facts. And, and the irony, of course, was that, uh, again, as my colleague Conan has pointed out, O.J. Simpson made so many friends, was trusted by so many people, and among them were LAPD officers. O.J. Simpson had a lot of friends in LAPD. They liked hanging out with him. They liked visiting his uh, Brentwood home. And uh, so it was kind of difficult to, that, that, to think that this would be a hidden agenda on, on LAPD's part to try to uh, pin the case on O.J. Simpson. But then, of course, there was that testimony, that controversy during the trial, that one of the lead detectives had used the N-word and had a racial animus toward African-Americans. So all of this was coming out during the nine months of the trial. And for many people, they fell back on what their gut told them, uh, whether O.J. Simpson was a good guy who could not possibly have done this, or whether looking at the cold, hard evidence, it uh, was a clear case uh, of, uh, of uh, gee, I'm blanking on the term I want, uh, but, but there, were, there was no direct uh, testimony. Nobody witnessed this crime. Uh, there, there was no description that the, the murder weapons were never found. There was some question of what became of them. So this was a case of, all right, I thought of the word, circumstantial evidence. Um, and people disagreed diametrically uh, whether that circumstantial evidence should hold, should hold the day, carry the case. And in the end, of course, it did not. Patrick, uh, your coverage continued through the civil trial as well. How did the tone of that case change? Well, of course, civil trials are, are very different. Uh, the standard is different. It does not have to be beyond a reasonable doubt. It merely has to be a preponderance of the evidence. And in that arena, uh, facing the facts, O.J. Simpson did not have a chance. And, and the, jury, the jury did find against him. Uh, but interestingly, uh, you know, Simpson maintained his, his, his poise, uh, maintained some semblance of control during the course of that trial. Uh, but all the while, he and his attorneys were talking about how they were going to try to delay and avoid paying the judgment. And uh, there was a major controversy that dragged on for years and years, for example, about O.J. Simpson's NFL pension from his professional football playing days. And that pension money was protected. And uh, he went to the mat over that so that the, so the Brown family and the Goldman family could not access that money. Could, could, could I make this one point? Yeah. Uh, well, Patrick uh, Conan, great to see you. Uh, we should point out that the, that the criminal trial was downtown, mm -hmm. much different jury pool. The civil trial was in Santa Monica. Much different, Much different jury pool. You had a very a, a dramatic disconnect within the city uh, over who was in judgment of this man, in criminal in the civil cases. Just thought I'd point that out. Yeah, Patrick, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? An, an incredibly telling point on Conan's part. And that was a lesson that we saw repeatedly during the 1990s, uh, hearkening back to the uh, uh, beating of Rodney King and the initial trial of the four uh, LAPD officers, three officers and a sergeant. That trial was held in uh, Simi Valley with a predominantly white jury and the officers were acquitted. And that was the, the trigger event, of course, for the rebellion of 1992. Uh, later, the federal government took on the case, filed charges of uh, deprivation of civil rights against the four officers. And in, in a separate trial in a different location in Los Angeles, not in suburban Simi Valley, uh, the officers were found guilty. So as we saw during the 1990s, location and jury uh, are, are the most important factors in determining the outcome of a trial. Now, you, we talk about this saga. I mean, it's, it's almost like the writing of a, of a script in Hollywood, but this is real life and it just continues. So now we're going years later, OJ's moved to Las Vegas and then the whole saga of the stolen sports memorabilia. Um, could you believe that you were actually covering yet another OJ trial? Well, it did come as a shock because OJ Simpson, if, you know, uh, he had many attributes, and one of them was being a, an extremely savvy person. And the fact that the bell did not go off in his head, 
uh, look, I want to get this uh, stuff back, this memorabilia. These are treasures from my life. They're mine. I'm entitled to possess them. But why the bell didn't go off in his head that, look, I can't hire a bunch of goons to go to a motel room and strong arm this guy and tell him to give me back my stuff. Yeah, it, it, it's beyond belief. And so, of course, it went to trial. And, of course, during the trial, it has to be said, there was considerable evidence that Simpson did not really know that his recruits would handle this as roughly and as brutally and display a handgun like they did. Uh, but even so, what, why Simpson did that is just, it, it, it's difficult to fathom. Of course, part of it may be that he also had the feeling that he had Teflon on him, that with all the evidence that was presented at that criminal trial, he was found not guilty. And he might have thought that lucky charm would stay with him uh, the rest of his life, uh, but clearly it did not in, in Las Vegas. All right, Patrick Healy, uh, retired NBC4 reporter. Always good to see you, and thanks for your time here this morning. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's great to have you here, too, Conan. Thank yeah. you for the insight. Uh, so much to talk about, and we'll continue to do that throughout the day for yeah. sure. It's depressing, I think. The whole thing yeah. is depressing. Yeah. Back then and today. And it still is yeah. now. Conan, thanks. Appreciate it. Also breaking here today, the uh, former interpreter of Dodger star Shohei Otani will likely face federal charges. Now, this is all related to a gambling investigation involving Ipe Misuhara. According to two sources familiar with that investigation, NBC4's John Caddy's Klimak is live at Dodger Stadium, where those charges will be announced momentarily. Uh, people really waiting to find out exactly what's going to happen here today, John. Hey, good morning, guys. Yeah, we're just waiting now for a press conference that we're going to bring to you live. It's the U.S. Uh, attorney that uh, is handling the case here in L.A. I want to take you inside the federal courthouse here in downtown Los Angeles so you can see what is happening there as they're preparing uh, for this big announcement. You see someone there at the podium. They're doing mic checks and such to make sure that everybody's ready for that. We know that there is going to be some uh, major information coming out of this. We believe it will include official federal charges against Ipe Mizuhara, the former interpreter for Dodger star Shohei Otani, with multiple counts, we understand. It stems from a former Orange County bookie illegally taking bets and accepting money that Otani says was stolen from his bank accounts by his former interpreter. And on top of that, NBC News has learned throughout this that Otani himself has been assisting in the federal investigation. Now, when news broke last month, he was painted as the victim. And today, that remains the case, apparently completely unaware of his close friend's alleged gambling addiction and Otani's loss of at least four and a half million dollars. It's possible today that we're going to be hearing that that could be a much higher number. We may even hear how that was even possible, that somebody could access Otani's bank accounts if he had a power of attorney somehow or if he just happened to know a password to get into it. That we haven't been able to understand just yet. We might get some information on that as well. Ms. Uhara, initially, you might remember, had said in an interview to ESPN that Otani had loaned him the money because of his gambling debt, eventually recanted that because Otani himself came out and said that was not the case, that Otani had no connection himself uh, to any gambling when it came to sports. And that could be something else that comes up in this press conference as well. So we want to wait and see uh, if they say anything about Otani, whether they're going to officially uh, and openly say that he is not part of this investigation, that they're going to clear him from this. We'll wait to see if uh, part of that comes up as well. The IRS special agent in charge uh, for their criminal investigations is here on scene getting ready to speak as well. So once we have all of that, we're going to bring that to you. And of course, the biggest news probably happening right now in Los Angeles, in addition to the death of O.J. Simpson. Guys. All right, John, appreciate it. More to come on that for sure. Uh, Conan is still here with us. We are, of course, uh, talking about the passing of O.J. Simpson here this morning, among other things. And, and Conan, what sticks out to me is, um, and I'm looking at uh, some screen grabs here of uh, O.J. Simpson's children. Um, is it by design, in your opinion, that we virtually heard nothing from them or have seen them in public over the last couple of decades? Well, yeah, you know, can, can you imagine? Um, no. Your father has yeah. been accused of murdering your mother. Yeah. Uh, they were motherless. And for uh, Sydney and the, for the rest of them, uh, this, I, I, it's really... Syria, it's, it's kind of stunning to figure out, to, to think where they were this whole time. Yeah. They wanted to believe their father. They heard so much about their mother. They knew of the cases of the beating. I mean, he was a, he, he abused her. There's no question about that. He even sort of admitted to that. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
but you have to go on with your life. And he's the only one left. And so um, I, I think there was a bond there. There's no question. But the complexity of emotions that they went through at the time and the ramifications of that over the course of their life uh, is, is, is something I don't think anybody anybody can put their uh, put put themselves in their shoes. There is some sort of reconciliation because according to the family statement they were with him his children were with him when he passed away. There, there, and there's no question it may not have been a reconciliation they may have been with him the entire time. The fact of the matter though is that they they know uh, what happened. Yeah. Uh, they they believe we'll, we'll just assume that they believe their father uh, but again they were in an extremely difficult position and have been their entire life. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we want to bring in now uh, Royal Oaks, our legal analyst. And Royal, we appreciate your time here this morning. You bet. All right. So OJ's trial changed the way we looked and examined uh, court cases uh, over the last 30 years. What impact has the trial had on the city of Los Angeles? Well, it's just so amazing. You're tempted to think about how astounding the situation was at the time. The national attention span was just stretched to the snapping point, but it didn't snap. We had a nine-month trial. And you know, you, you do radio talk shows, three hours, nothing but calls about O.J. Simpson and, and you know, race and sex and celebrity and sports. It had all those things. But for, for a lasting impact, I, I think three things. Number one, cameras in the courtroom. Uh, it was very difficult to convince Judge Ito to keep the cameras. He once brought us in, the lawyers for the media, and he pointed to 20 boxes filled with letters from all over the world saying, pull the plug on the cameras. They're showboating. This is a media circus. And we made the pitch that the First Amendment, that sunlight is the best disinfectant, and, and people are entitled to see the judicial system at work. And so it worked there. The cameras rolled. But after that, it's been very difficult. A lot of judges are reluctant to do that. And that's a shame because we are entitled to see what's going on in the courtroom. Number two, nullification. So the classic deal is you know, the stoner is on, on the jury, and he's not about to vote to convict a guy because the guy was possessing marijuana. And yet, the guy on the jury promises, yes, I'll abide by the law, but then he doesn't. Well, in a different context, if you sincerely believe the criminal justice system is racist, then it's okay to vote against the cops and in favor of a, a guy, a black man accused of killing two people. I mean, for a jury to listen to this stuff, incredibly complex for nine months, and then take essentially an hour or so to deliberate between electing a foreman and getting ordering a ham sandwich, there was about an hour of deliberation, and people were shocked by that. And, and so that's something that persists to today. Are we really comfortable with the criminal justice system, or do we have to do something dramatic to, to fight back against alleged racists? And then the final issue is celebrity justice. I mean, a lot of people think because O.J. was so charismatic and so famous and so wealthy, and he had the dream team, Alan Dershowitz and, 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 uh, and Johnny Cochran and the rest, uh, is it really fair? And then the flip side of that is in Las Vegas. He spent nine years in prison for something that probably would have been a slap on the wrist if he had not been O.J. Simpson. Most people saw this as a do-over. They couldn't believe it. O.J. Simpson in trouble again to the point where he could spend decades behind bars. Fortunately for him, it wasn't 33 years. It was nine years. But it just shows that this syndrome of celebrity justice, you never know who it's going to help and who it's going to hurt. Royal, in hindsight now, um, as we're looking back at all of this history and all these layers, what do you think O.J. Simpson will be remembered for in terms of the legal sense? What do you think will be the one thing people will think about when they hear his name? You know, the phrase, they framed a guilty man, comes to mind. I think most people are going to say, no brainer, he was a double murderer. They're also going to say, hmm, Mark Furman, using the N-word with the screenwriter from North Carolina, uh, he's a racist. He's the guy that finds the bloody glove behind O.J. Simpson's uh, property there. And so, you know, there are two ways to look at it. Yeah, he killed the two people. On the other hand, these cops were racist. And in general, we think the system is racist. It's just so much clash and controversy. I mean, everybody's talking about the trial of the century. It'll be very interesting to see if Donald Trump's trial starting Monday and who knows what will come after that will rival the attention we paid to O.J. Simpson. I have a feeling Trump is going to come in second to O.J. Simpson. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. No doubt about that, Royal. I mean, uh, whatever you say about Donald Trump, he doesn't have, uh, again, 
uh, you know, the way you put it, it there was there was there, not only was there race and there was justice and there was celebrity, there was sex in it. You have to remember that one of the jurors ended up posing a Playboy magazine. There was a woman he <laughs> dated who was a Playboy model. I mean, I had a friend of mine who once back then said, you know, this trial is the best thing that's happened to L.A. in a long time. And I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, prior to this, you had the Rodney King riots. You had the earthquake. This place, where your, your, your city was going, you know, uh, it, it, it was nothing but death and destruction. But now it's Brentwood and Playboy models and high-end attorneys and, and uh, beautiful people. And you realize, okay, this is, this is L.A. This is Hollywood. It, it's a celebrity murder. And I thought, wow, you know, it... In, in so many respects, people saw this trial in such a different, uh, different lens based on where they were. But I have to also say uh, that was arguably the worst run celebrity trial I have ever seen. Uh, Royal, come on. Uh, it was the number of movie stars or, you know, guys like Larry King. I remember once waiting for uh, waiting. You know, O.J. was in the it was at the at the desk. The judge was, we were waiting for Lance Ito to show up, and then we couldn't under, understand why it was taking so long. And Larry King, the celebrity interviewer from CNN, pops out a door uh, on the other side of the bench, looks around because, oh, I'm, and I'm late. He'd been talking to Lance Ito all that time. That's why everybody's waiting. That's why everybody's waiting, wait, waiting. And, and that's, that's the other thing about the trials, that celebrities showed up. Right. And and Lance Ito, God bless him. Uh, you know he's a he's an able jurist, but I think he was overwhelmed by the celebrity aspect of this. Really case. quickly, can you talk about all the stuff that wasn't put into evidence? Because I think it's really fascinating. All the things we know about, but the jurors never heard. Well, well I mean, I, I don't believe they heard from, as you pointed out earlier, the uh, the what was a, what, what a, we, we thought was a suicide note. Robert Kardashian reads this uh, a note that sounds like you know he's a fugitive from justice at the time, and I thought it was okay. They, he's about to commit suicide, uh, blaming the media. Um, they didn't hear about that. And, and, but uh, there's a lot they didn't hear about. Frankly, I don't think it mattered. I mean, the Royals, right. I mean, this was um, the fact that they deliberated for an hour yeah. after a nine-month trial yeah. indicated this was lost probably at the very yeah, they beginning. They had their minds made up. Yeah. As we get ready for, to hear from the Department of Justice here on this other breaking news story, uh, Conan, really quickly before we go here, uh, Royal used the terminology framed a guilty man. Mm -hmm. Some might say O.J. gamed the system. Well, uh, it, the, it, some also would say that this was the culmination of years of discriminatory police practices by the LAPD. Okay. That, uh, and I believe the department, there is plenty of reason to believe the department today is vastly different, vastly different from what we saw in the Daryl Gates era. But all that happened in that trial didn't happen just during that trial. Right. It was set up by years. You can go back to the 65 riots and before that uh, of, of a disconnect, a deep disconnect within the black community. And although O.J. Simpson wasn't really considered a member of the black community, he, right. he was very much not interested in that. And by all uh, by all estimation, they said this was our guy. Um, and they had a very good reason for that. All right. All right. Thank Conan. you for that. Well, we're going to move on to our other big story here this morning. Right now, federal authorities are announcing charges against Dodgers star Shohei Otani's former interpreter, E.P. Mitsuhara. This is a connection with a gambling investigation tied to the investigation of a former Orange County bookie. Let's listen in. Hatcher, a special agent in charge, Eddie Wang, of Homeland Security Investigations. We are here to announce today the filing of a federal criminal complaint against Ipe Mizuhara, a person who until recently was employed as a translator for professional baseball player Shohei Otani. The federal complaint filed just a few minutes ago charges Mitsuhara with bank fraud for allegedly stealing more than $16 million from Mr. Otani. According to the complaint, Mr. Mitsuhara stole this money largely to finance his voracious appetite for illegal sports betting. Our investigation revealed that Mitsuhara, a Japanese language interpreter, began working as a translator for Mr. Otani when he first came to the United States to, be, to begin playing professional baseball. Mr. Mitsuhara had first met Mr. Otani in 2013, so the two knew each other. Mr. Otani did not speak or understand English, while Mr. Mitsuhara knew English and was familiar with the United States. As such, Mr. Mizuhara 
not only translated for Mr. Otani, but also acted as his de facto manager. And Our investigation has revealed that Mr. Mitsuhara, a Japanese language interpreter, began working as a translator for Mr. Otani when Mr. Otani first came to the United States to begin playing professional baseball. Mr. Mitsuhara had first met Mr. Otani in 2013, so the two men knew each other. Mr. Otani did not speak or understand English, while Mr. Mitsuhara knew English and was familiar with the United States. As a result, Mr. Mitsuhara acted as Mr. Otani's de facto manager. In 2018, shortly after Mr. Otani arrived from Japan, Mr. Mitsuhara helped Mr. Otani set up a bank account. That was a bank account that was used to deposit Mr. Otani's salary payments from professional baseball. Mr. Mitsuhara had access to that bank account and he refused to give access to Mr. Otani's other professional advisors, including his agent, his accountant, and his financial advisor. And he told them that Mr. Otani wanted to keep that account private. In 2021, Mr. Mitsuhara began placing sports bets with a group of bookmakers who were linked to an illegal gambling operation. Over time, Mr. Mitsuhara's bets became more and more frequent. And over time, Mr. Mitsuhara's bets became larger and larger in amounts. Messages between Mr. Mitsuhara and the bookmaker show that he lost considerable money on those bets, but he continued to make the wagers, thousands of wagers over time. The bets do not appear to have been made on the sport of baseball. At the same time he started placing the bets with bookmakers, Mr. Mitsuhara began using Mr. Otani's account to make payments for the bank account. Mr. Mitsuhara had helped set up the account, so he's familiar with it, and he used that familiarity to access the account. The evidence we've gathered over the past few weeks has demonstrated that in total, Mr. Mitsuhara stole over $16 million from Mr. Otani's account in order to pay for these illegal sports bets. Phone and bank records show that Mr. Mitsuhara appears to have accessed Mr. Otani's bank account online. What is more, Mr. Mitsuhara lied to the bank to access the account. For instance, we obtained recordings of telephone calls in which Mitsuhara spoke with bank employees, lied to them about being Mr. Otani, gave personal biographical information for Mr. Otani, in order to impersonate him, and thereby convince the bank to approve large wire transfers of large amounts of money to the bookmakers. I want to emphasize this point. Mr. Otani is considered a victim in this case. There is no evidence to indicate that Mr. Otani authorized the over $16 million of transfers from his account to the bookmakers. Mr. Tani has stated that he did not authorize these transfers, that he did not grant Mitsuhara access to his account. But on top of that, we reviewed both Mitsuhara's and Mr. Tani's phones and their communications over time, over several years, thousands of communications reviewed by a Japanese linguist. And that review has demonstrated no discussion of betting wagers, or authorization for transfers to bookmakers. Furthermore, there would have been no reason for Mr. Mitsuhara to impersonate Mr. Otani in calls with the bank if these transfers had been authorized. Also, when Mr. Mitsuhara would occasionally win on his sports bets, the winnings were not deposited in Mr. Otani's bank account, but rather in Mr. Mitsuhara's personal bank account. Finally, 
in a text message with one of the bookmakers, which is detailed in the complaint, which is avail available to you, Mr. Mitsuhara admitted to the bookmaker to stealing from Mr. Otani. Let me summarize. Our investigation has revealed that due to the position of trust he occupied with Mr. Otani, Mr. Mitsuhara had unique access to Mr. Otani's finances. Mr. Mitsuhara used and abused that position of trust in order to take advantage of Mr. Otani. Mr. Mitsuhara used and abused that position of trust in order to plunder Mr. Otani's bank account to the tune of over $16 million. And Mr. Mitsuhara did all this to feed his insatiable appetite for illegal sports betting. In this way, we allege in the complaint, Mr. Mitsuhara committed fraud on a massive scale. And let me note, what we filed today here is a complaint. Mr. Mitsuhara is presumed to be innocent, but you can see all the allegations that we've made in the complaint that's been filed. Finally, let me offer some thanks in this case. I want to thank the amazing investigative team in this case for the work that they did. Investigators with IRS criminal investigation, investigators with Homeland Security investigations, and with our office, the United States Attorney's Office for the Central District of California, worked tirelessly, worked quickly, and worked thoroughly to bring this charge against Mr. Mitsuhara. I want to thank, in particular, the Assistant United States Attorneys in my office who worked on this case. That would be AUSA's Jeff Mitchell, AUSA Rachel Agress, and AUSA Dan Boyle. Let me now, before we take any Q&A, introduce to the podium IRS Special Agent in Charge Tyler Hatcher. Good morning. Thanks, Martin. <clears throat> As you've heard, my name is Tyler Hatcher. I'm the special agent in charge for IRS criminal investigation here in the Los Angeles field office. We often get asked, why is IRS involved in these kind of cases? And IRS criminal investigation special agents are the best in the world at following the money. And I want to uh, give my comments to, uh, to shed some light on, on how quickly the federal government, and in particular U.S. Attorney's Office, my office, and HSI, marshaled our resources to get a resolution to a victim, and in this case, Mr. Otani. The criminal complaint that was filed today definitively shows that that money, the $16 million that's in question, was in fact stolen. And we want to continue IRS criminal investigations' um, efforts in protecting sports at the highest levels. We have a long history of getting involved in cases uh, dealing with sports at the highest levels, and this is just another great example of the federal government working together for a quick resolution. I'll turn that over to Eddie Wing. Thanks, Tyler. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eddie Wong, and I'm the special agent in charge for Homeland Security Investigations here in Los Angeles. Uh, HSI is the principal investigative arm of the Department of Homeland Security, and one of our top priorities is targeting illicit uh, financial activities. As you just heard earlier today, a uh, federal criminal complaint was filed alleging that Mr. Ipe Mizuhara uh, illegally transferred billions of dollars from Mr. Otani's bank account for which he was not authorized to do so. These charges stem from the outstanding work of our special agents uh, assigned to the HSI-led El Camino Real Financial Crimes Task Force, who worked collaboratively with our steadfast partners at the IRS Criminal Investigation and the U.S. Attorney's Office. In particular, I'd like to take a quick second to recognize uh, the outstanding work uh, done by the prosecutors on this case, uh, Assistant uh, U.S. Attorneys uh, Jeff Mitchell, Dan Boyle, and Rachel Agres. Thank you for your work on this matter. Uh, look, there is much work to be done regarding financial crime in the greater Los Angeles metropolitan area, uh, but the, elder, uh, the El Camino Real Financial Crimes Task Force is up to the challenge and will continually, well, excuse me, and will continue to deal diligently target financial crimes like this. Thank you. I'll try to coordinate Q&A, so show of hands. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> I see no uh, What started the investigation? What led you to look into this? I mean, um, 
find uh, Mr. Mazzamara? There was an ongoing federal criminal investigation into illegal uh, gambling businesses operating not just in our district but throughout the country, and that investigation ultimately revealed this bank fraud. We understood there was a significant amount of public interest in this case. There were a lot of question marks out there in terms of what had occurred. We wanted to get to those questions. I want to emphasize, though, that while we were able to work on this case uh, rapidly, it was a very thorough investigation. You will see in the complaint review of thousands of communications, review of bank records, review of phone records, uh, interviews that were done with several individuals related to this. So a very thorough investigation was done. And if I could ask a quick follow-up, you said earlier that you don't believe that the bets were made on baseball. How certain are you of that at this moment? Based on the review that we have done, and it is, as I mentioned, a very thorough review, we do not believe any bets were made on baseball games. Yes. Given all the evidence that you just laid out, what kind of penalty or punishment do you think Mr. Mizuhara could be facing? And does Mr. Otani have any chance of ever recouping any of that money that has been lost and stolen? Mr. Mitsuhara faces a charge of bank fraud. Bank fraud carries a statutory maximum penalty of 30 years imprisonment. But the ultimate sentence that he would receive, if convicted, would be based on a determination by the judge. The judge considers all the factors, all the background to come up with the appropriate sentence. That is for the court to decide. We will provide all the facts to make sure the court is fully informed in making that decision. Can you talk about the degree to which Mr. Otani cooperated with the investigation? Mr. Otani, as I mentioned, has been established as a victim in this case. I want to be clear that Mr. Otani has cooperated fully and completely in this investigation. He's not only spoken to investigators, he's provided access to his digital devices, uh, to his personal information, to ensure that justice was done in this case. And to what degree did uh, EPIC cooperate? Excuse me, I didn't hear your question. To what degree did EPIC cooperate in the investigation, Mr. Mitsuhara? Uh, Mr. Mitsuhara is charged in this case. He's presumed innocent, and I'll leave it at that. So this is the filing of a criminal complaint. Those are allegations that have been made. A criminal charge is filed. Uh, Mr. Mitsuhara will now have to appear on that criminal complaint. That appearance should happen sometime in the next few days. Following that, we will prosecute the case wherever it goes. Whether Mr. Mitsuhara admits his guilt or whether he decides to contest his guilt, we will follow it where the law appropriately leads us. He will be appearing in federal district court in our district. I'll get you the details on that. Any more? How much, how much go, go right here. Go will Mr. Otani continue to be asked to um, take part in the investigation? Mr. Otani has cooperated, as I said, completely and fully in this investigation. We expect him to continue to cooperate fully uh, in this investigation. We don't have specifics in terms of requests that we would have right now. 